All right, so today um, we're going to talk a little bit about the differences and some of the senior living options available to you in the state of Florida. So anything I talk about today is specific to the rules and laws here in Florida. And first of all, I'd like to go over some numbers with you. Um, did you know that 70% of our senior population will require some kind of long-term care during their life? And with that is that those 85 years and older are currently 15% of the population and this will increase to 25% of the population about year 2050. So currently in the year 2010, which is now over 10 years ago, 6 million Americans were over the age of 85. And this is going to quadruple by 2050 up to 21 million people. Ooh. One in eight people over the age of 65 have Alzheimer's disease. One in eight. One in eight, yeah. And 50% of our elders age 85 or older have Alzheimer's disease. So when you look at one in eight of people at 65 years and 50% of elders 85 and older have Alzheimer's disease. And I'm sorry to say two thirds of those are women. But primarily that's because we live longer than, than men and uh, we have hormone related issues and some things that promote brain change, which results typically in some form of dementia. And statistics indicate that one in three households in America is currently providing caregiving to a family member. And 33% of us that are baby boomers, meaning we were born between 46 and 64, care for our parents. So those are some pretty startling numbers, aren't they? Yes. So let's understand your senior options today. We're going to talk about continuing care retirement communities, which are known as CCRCs. We're going to talk a little bit about standard independent living and assisted living. Thrown in there a little bit, I'm going to talk about skilled nursing because that is um, an option for most of our seniors if they need some kind of rehabilitation after an illness or an injury. So when we talk about a continuing care retirement community, they are designed for seniors 55 years or older, and they offer what's called a continuum of care, which is housing and certain services and health care. Health care means there is a skilled nursing care center typically on site. CCRCs are typically buy-in communities. So a buy-in community means they're looking for 30, 50, 100, 300 plus thousand dollars up front, depending on the community and its location, um, before you even start paying a monthly rent. And so you're signing a contract to be guaranteed with that buy-in housing and nursing services typically for your entire life. What happened though when they built CCRCs? They built an independent living community, typically very active, uh, a lot of active services. And then they put a nursing home on, on site for those residents who needed some rehab or nursing care. But at the time they were building these CCRCs, assisted living was not really a thing. It didn't come along until well into the 80s. And so assisted living and these days more frequently used even is secured memory care communities are not typically part of a CCRC's community because they, they weren't built that way. And what they're having to do now is either go back and add these lifestyles to their care, you know, their continuum of care, or they outsource those services to other local communities that do offer an assisted living community or do offer, more importantly, a secured environment 
for those who need memory care. But that does mean for many couples who live in a CCRC that if one of them needs memory care, they have to be relocated to an offsite community and it, the other spouse is left remaining and that defeats the purpose of them wanting to be together. So the CCRCs have, have been over the last few years adding these services because they realize they're losing a lot of their clients who, who need care that they don't provide and they have to pay for someone else to provide it. Because if you bought that CCRC that promised you care for life and they don't have secured memory care and you or your spouse need it and they send you to a memory care community somewhere else, that CCRC has to pay the bill. And so that impacts their financials as well, because that's not something that they, they want to do. They don't want to pay somebody else to do care when they're not actually being paid for that themselves. But the CCRCs are, um, their money goes into an, an insurance program. So these continuing care retirement communities have oversight through a state insurance board primarily and if they have an on-site nursing facility, like a, a nursing rehab center, the license is specific to that piece of care. So the licenses would apply by the type of care they offer. A standard independent living community has no license. They're not overseen by um, the Agency for Healthcare Administration, anything like that, or JCO, which is a nursing home oversight um, agency. But if they do offer assisted living or memory care or a nursing home, they do have state regulators that will come in for those lifestyles. Now, the difference between stand, what we call a standard independent living and a CCRC is CCRCs, again, are designed for people 55 years and older, but they don't, they're not typically a buy-in. It's a monthly rental and you're not promised anything. You're not promised care for life. You're not signing a contract for that kind of care. You're not putting up front tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're just choosing an apartment that offers perhaps some housekeeping services, one or two meals a day, transportation and social programs. And you pay a monthly fee you are not locked in as in a CCRC. If you put in all that money up front, you, you, you risk losing part of it if you decide you don't wanna live there anymore based on whatever con your contract said. For, for, for most independent living, think of it as an apartment or a villa or a house that's in a community that have uh, active seniors and they have if they're in a, if it's in a large high rise building, they might have a swimming pool and they'll have fitness centers and they'll have game rooms and art rooms. So it, it pulls people together in a more social environment, but you're not locked in with large sums of money. There is no state license required. You're basically covered by the, the state's hotel motel oversight, which means the board of health comes in and makes sure that your kitchens, if you're offering food service, that your kitchens meet the Department of Health standards and that your community you know, doesn't have ceilings falling in and roofs falling in and carpets not frayed and nasty and there's not mold growing, those kinds of things. So it's the Board of Health that oversees the living conditions, but there's no license involved in offering independent living. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, so if you're, go ahead. Did you have a question? I didn't. Okay. So why would you choose to live in an independent living community or a continuing care retirement community? For most people, um, they don't wanna keep up with home maintenance anymore. There is the pool to take care of, the yard to take care of, the hurricane came through and punched holes in your pool screen or damaged your roof. And so 
when you're in a, an independent living or a CCRC type community, you don't have to worry about house maintenance, home maintenance, that stuff's all taken care of for you. There's also an aspect of socialization that many people seek, particularly if they've lost a spouse. It's harder and harder to get out. You maybe to drive, you don't wanna drive at night. Um, traffic, particularly in the central Florida area can be very crazy. And so it's, you, you become more sheltered, more reclusive sometimes when you stay home versus finding a community where others are in the similar circumstances and you start to socialize more. You, they typically offer some kind of meal plan with fine dining, maybe a continental breakfast and a, and a fine dinner. And for many people, just going into that type of dining room and um, sitting down for a meal is more socialization than they've seen personally, sometimes for years. And so it, it offers companionship, it offers socialization, it offers an opportunity to participate in hobbies that maybe you haven't um, been able to enjoy for a while, you know, art classes or outings, you know, there's trips to other countries or to the Hard Rock Seminole Gambling Center over in Tampa, you know, whatever that is that, that they may be offering, it is attractive to those people who don't wanna take care of a house anymore, don't wanna perhaps worry about um, having to cook um, a meal every day or to uh, want to see their friends, want to participate in socialized activities. These options for independent living and continuing care retirement communities are very attractive for those reasons. But then you have to look for who pays for it. Basically, you do. Independent living is fully private pay. You cannot um, use typically your long-term care insurance policies because those typically have clauses in them that require you to need some kind of care. And those care is not offered at independent living communities. You cannot get veterans benefits. Again, those are related to care. And so anything that you do in an independent living or a CCRC is paid out of pocket. Costs start $2,500 a month. That's, that's a low, low end for independent living. If you're looking at a CCRC where you paid a couple hundred thousand dollars up front to get in, your rent may be $2,500 a month because they're earning money off of the interest in the, those insurance boards that they, they deposited your, your payments in. So 2,500 may work for what's called a CCRC if you've put in a lot of upfront dollars, but for standard independent living, 2,500 a month is actually a little low. I would go closer to 3,500 for that. And again, the CCRC monthly costs vary based on your buy-in. So the higher your buy-in, the lower your monthly fee. The appeal to that is that if you need nursing home care and you're in a CCRC, your monthly fee does not change. So if you're only paying $2,500 a month to live in independent and you end up um, injuring yourself and going into their rehab for 120 days or whatever the, the rehab is, your fee does not change. It's still gonna be $2,500 a month versus standard nursing home care in the state of Florida at a minimum is going to run $8,000 a month. So there is an appeal there, but if you don't ever use that nursing home care while you're living in a CCRC, um, your, your benefit, there's no benefit to you to move into a CCRC. So it's kind of a, um, will I ever need it? Do I wanna pay that money upfront to be guaranteed a flat rate? You know, how much money do I get back if I pass away? What am I, what, what will my heirs um, receive? There's a lot of questions about what happens to all that money you put in up front. But it's, you know, and it, it, it depends on the contract you sign with that CCRC. They have, they have various contracts. So, so 
Ms. Bruce, do you have any questions for me about independent living or continuing care retirement communities? Can you think of anything? We right don't. Now? In Bavard County, we don't have any CCRC living. I don't, yeah. I don't believe you do. Um, I think that uh, they're not building new CCRCs. The, the, the newest one that I know that is going to be under construction is at the University of Central Florida, but that's years away. They're actually just working on that. Uh, but yes, Brevard County does not have a CCRC. So is there, why did they stop building them or? Uh, I, I think it was just a matter of so many other senior living options came along that it wasn't as beneficial for them to, to put in that kind of money to build just basically an independent living and nursing homes. Many nursing homes in the state of Florida, because of the litigious nature, all of the lawsuits, many nursing homes started to close and leave the state of Florida. And so a lot of the CCRCs did not wanna get involved in that arena of lawyers and lawsuits based on their nursing homes. And so they were better off just building an assisted living or an independent living and not worrying about nursing home care. Oh, okay. So basically you just go from independent living then to assisted living if you need it and then memory care if you need it. But each each level is more expensive. Correct. Okay. Yes. yes, and so let's talk about assisted living. So assisted living, basically people can be as independent as they choose to be in an assisted living community. You can still have your car, you can still come and go, you have visitors, you have friends. Your lifestyle is what you need it to be in an assisted living community. And so many people live there very independently, but maybe their spouse or even themselves, they need a little bit more assistance. They need someone to help with some medications or someone to help with their mobility or their dressing or grooming. So those types of services would not be available in an independent living unless you paid for them. If you paid an outside home health agency to come in and help you with that. So, if you're in independent living and you do need those services, the, your costs are going to go up because you're going to have to pay for an outside agency to assist you. In assisted living, it's their staff that help you. So you're not, you're not concerned about who's going to show up today. You know, I didn't like that caregiver they sent yesterday, but who am I, who's going to come today or do they show up? Because when you use those outside agencies, they're, you take the chance of not always getting the service you need because they struggle sometimes to find staff and send people out. Or, you know, if you don't like a certain person, maybe they don't have anybody else available to you. Whereas in an assisted living community, all of the services that they provide to you are provided by their own staff. Not to say you can't bring in additional help. That is more than um, allowable. You pay for that. But most people coming into assisted living utilize the services and the staff that are on site. And assisted livings are regulated by the Agency for Healthcare Administration. So you have to apply for a license, you have to meet certain criteria, and then the state of Florida from the Agency for Healthcare Administration comes into your community at any time and they quote unquote survey you, they audit you. You know, are you providing medications correctly. They'll watch the med passes. They'll go into your kitchen and make sure your food temperatures are correct and your kitchens are clean and, and that your staff are trained according to state regulations. So they have a lot of oversight to make sure that your community is running by state guidelines. Some communities are very small. They may be a six bed house where someone, you know, someone's converted a home into a very small six bed assisted living, or they could be large assisted livings with, you know, 60 apartments or 200 apartments. The size is not regulated. It's just the services you provide, you have to be able to, you have to be able to provide what you promise people. So, so and, when, and, go ahead. So when you, when you go into assisted living, 
Mm-hmm. Are all of those things listed on the page provided or do they cost extra for different things? Well, it depends on the, the, the community itself. Everybody, you can do it both ways. Some communities have what's called a level of care system, which is a point system. So let's say you need um, assistance with bathing and you need assistance with medications and you need help uh, getting dressed. You may, that may all be worth to that company 100 points. I'm just using a number. Mm -hmm. And that 100 points equates to a specific monthly fee associated with that. So it's not necessarily what do I get for my $300? It's what do you need? How many points are you going to use to reach that level of care? But some communities do it what's called a la carte. So they may say, oh, you need us to help you bathe every month. That's $100 extra a month. Or you need help, um, you know, take with your medications. That's another $100 a month. So either way the community chooses to do it is up to them, but they have to outline that to potential clients up front. You have to be able to show this is your monthly rate and this is what it would cost you if you need additional services. So it is different for every company. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Now, there are some companies they might offer a special that might say, um, we're offering a locked in rate with that's all inclusive. If you sign today, your rent will be $3,000 a month and you will never pay more for a level of care. It's all inclusive. So those, those people do offer those deals. Those are incentives to get people to move in. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, but not everybody does that. So it, it, it really, it's really based on what the company that, that, that owns that community allows them to do. And some communities that are assisted living may not provide all of those services. So even though we can, in the assisted living industry, uh, provide assistance with medications, some communities may not do that because they don't have a nurse available to oversee the medication um, supervision. So the residents would have to be able to take their own medications if they lived there. Or they don't um, help with incontinence care. So assisted livings are allowed to provide a variety of services, but not every assisted living chooses to provide all of them. So you really have to ask those questions and say, what happens if I need help going to the bathroom? What if I am incontinent? What if I can take my medications today, but I know that I, you know, in in a year, what happens if I can't do that? Do you have somebody to help me with that? Because you don't want to have to move again. You know, your goal would be to make whatever, whatever this is, perhaps your final move. Let me live my life out here. And how are you going to support me in doing that? So um, some of your bigger companies are better at offering more services, but you end up, you know, you might end up in a bigger community is that, you know, that you might have a hundred people instead of six. So what lifestyle works best for you? And the fees vary based on the size of your apartment, based on the services that you need. Um, By law in Florida, every assisted living has to provide three full meals a day. There's no um, getting around that. That's actually in the regulations. So you, most assisted living apartments don't have full kitchens. They'll have kitchenettes, a microwave and a refrigerator and a kitchen sink, because we don't, we know that those residents are not going to do a lot of cooking. And so that's a little different when you go into your independent living apartments because they might only provide one meal a day. So we have to make sure that you have a full kitchen in order to, for you to prepare your other meals. And so sometimes coming into assisted living for someone who always loved to cook, uh, who was a very good cook, it's a big change if they are not able to do that anymore. I think that's probably one of the things I see people struggle with the most 
particularly if it's a married couple and the wife's been an excellent cook and she wants to make sure her husband enjoys the same food that she's always been able to prepare and nobody makes lasagna like she makes lasagna kind of thing. <laughs> it can be a hard adjustment if someone is um, still wanting to cook to be able to find a place that has a full kitchen would be very difficult. But we want people to enjoy their social lives too and not have to worry about going shopping and, and, and preparing food. You know, let us do that for you. Those are the kinds of things that, that assisted living is meant to do. Now, assisted livings might have a nurse on site. They may not have a nurse on site. And sometimes that depends on those services that they provide. When medications are involved, a nurse has to at least be available. That does not mean that a nurse is always in the building on site. It just means that, that the staff have someone to reach out to if they have questions about medications. So a nurse has to be available to take those orders from the doctors as well. Um, you, you cannot take an order for a medication unless you are a licensed nurse. So some communities offer 24-hour nursing on site, some offer a nurse available. So those are all things you need to look at if you think somebody needs help with medications. I would say medications are the number one reason most people move into an assisted living community is they, they are on a lot of medications, they are on maybe some challenging medications, um, they need they need supervision with it, and they need someone to monitor their condition based on the medications that they take. So here we go again. Your monthly fee is based on your room size in assisted living. We have um, all assisted livings can offer a private room, or they can offer a what's called a semi-private or a shared room. Services, if you move into an assisted living, have to include three meals a day. They also have to include daily activities, housekeeping and laundry at, at some level. Your caregivers can be on site 24 hours a day or in some of the smaller homes, they actually have sleeping accommodations because they have a caregiver on site, but they're not always awake. If you have the smaller six bed communities, those staff work sometimes like three days on, four days off, and then four days on, which means they sleep during the night. So you, you know, might always wanna ask the question, are your staff awake 24 hours a day or do you allow them um, a place to sleep? They typically offer some kind of personal care assistance and that ranges from grooming assistance, showering, toileting, dressing, um, and even ambulation, assistance with tra you know, walking, transferring from one chair to another, those kinds of things. And then most assisted livings offer what's called a respite stay, which is a temporary stay, maybe seven days, maybe 30 days. Typically after 30 days, they want you to sign a, a, a contract with them. But they also many offer day services, which is a great way to um, you know, if, if, if you think maybe mom's alone too much at home when I'm working, but I want to keep her home with me, can I take her someplace that would let her enjoy the company of others during the day, have activities and have a meal or two, and, and then I can pick her up at night and take her home. So day services and respite care services are wonderful options particularly if someone's not quite ready to make the move or if you just want to test a community out. Let's say you're thinking about moving somewhere and you really want to experience it for a couple of days and see how you're going to feel about it. You should make arrangements for a respite stay and say, you know, I want to be here for three days or what's your minimum respite stay? It might be seven days. Um, and, and then they provide you with a room, with furniture, with bedding, all of those things. And you just bring your suitcase and enjoy yourself for a few days and see if that's the right place for you. And then we, we did mention the um, personal care charges. Like I mentioned, it can be, uh, rarely is it included in the base rent unless it's offered as an all-inclusive rate. 
and care can be either offered either a la carte or through a point based system. And your point system can think about it, the more hands on someone provides you, the higher your points will be. And that equates to a higher level of care. And why do you want to choose assisted living? Again, medications are probably the number one thing I see with people needing um, some assistance, either for themselves or for a spouse even. Um, fitness, socialization, being able to have well-planned meals that are available three times a day. People will eat better if they don't have to go in the kitchen and cook a meal three times a day. Um, they just, it's just, you know, it's the, the socialization is there, the food is there, the, the laundry gets done, the housekeeping gets done. Those kinds of things are why someone would choose an assisted living community. And let's talk about who pays for it. There are multiple ways that someone can receive financial assistance for assisted living. One is long-term care insurance. If you had ever purchased a long-term care insurance policy, and they're all different, they all have different rules of what they require before they pay you, um, but most long-term care insurance policies pay a daily rate based on the level of care and, of course, the type of policy you have. There used to be what we called Cadillac policies that said it doesn't matter what your fees are every month and how long you need this care, you, we will pay whatever it is every month until the end of your life once you move into an assisted living. Well, those companies started going broke. So they stopped selling those Cadillac policies and now they have ones that are perhaps will pay um, $150 a day and it's for either $500,000 or five years. You know, every, every policy is a little different. Veterans Aid and Attendance is a great program. It is for wartime veterans or their surviving spouse. And there are some guidelines as to that person yeah. having to have served during a conflict or a wartime. And they had to have been married to the spouse um, and not remarried, you know, so if, if it's a second marriage, that second, the second wife may, may not get the veteran's aid and attendance because she wasn't married to the veteran at time of service. But it is, it is based on income. So there's a sliding scale of income and disability with the VA, but it's a, it's a huge benefit for, for veterans and or their surviving spouses. You just have to move into an assisted living before you qualify for that benefit or certain home care uh, advantages as well. If you have to have people come into your home, you can also uh, uh, file for aid and attendance through the VA for certain things at home as well. Some people have life insurance policies that can actually be cashed out and the funds go towards their, their living. Uh, so there are companies such, such as Life Care Funding, which will buy your life insurance policy from you. They, of course, they take their fee from that, and then you get the rest of the money to use. Maybe you want to prepay for some funeral services, and then the rest you can actually spend to take to live your life at that point if your policy has a, you know, a substantial amount of money that, you know, that why wait until you're gone for somebody else to get the life insurance kind of, but that's their idea with that. So it works very well for many people. And then there are what's called bridge loans. There's temporary assistance while waiting for, let's say VA benefits to kick in or for a home to sell. So a company like Elder Life Financial, they would actually off, you know, pay for your assisted living fees while they help you get that VA approval or wait for your home to sell. They'll give you so much money to cover the costs until those things occur. And those are called bridge loans. If you don't have any of these things we just talked about, or you still need, 
make up the difference, it's out of pocket. Medicare and Medicaid do not pay for assisted living fees like this. Those are hospital insurance coverages and financial um, Medicaid is for those who financially need some assistance, but very rarely does that money qualify in assisted living. So if you don't have the funding as outlined through long-term care insurance, veterans aid and attendance, a bridge loan, those kinds of things, you'd have to pay out of pocket. Assisted living starts at approximately $3,500 a month plus care. And if you need memory care, which is a secured environment, that's gonna start you at at least $4,500 a month typically plus care. So do you have any questions so far? No, you've been answering as I go along. <laughs> oh, good, good to hear. Okay, so let's talk about nursing and rehab centers a little bit. We call these in, the, in, our, in our world, we call them SNFs, which is a skilled nursing facility. <clears throat> skilled nursing facilities offer long and short-term care for individuals who need rehab services or who suffer from serious or persistent health issues that are too complicated to be treated at home or in an assisted living community. Typically a stay in a nursing home is initiated by a hospitalization. And so particularly for Medicare, now Medicare and Medicaid will cover primarily the costs of a skilled nursing center. So if someone falls and breaks a hip and goes to the hospital and has surgery, and now they need to go somewhere and get some rehab, once they've been in the hospital for three days, they are allowed to go on to a rehab center or a nursing home for that rehab, and Medicare will continue to pay to cover their costs if you have Medicare. If you don't have Medicare, you have to look at what other insurances you have that would cover that cost. But typically it's initiated by a hospitalization for most people before they go on into a nursing home. And nursing homes are highly regulated. They are, all, they are licensed by the Agency for Healthcare Administration, just like assisted living, but they are also receiving their accreditation through the Joint Commission on Accreditation in Healthcare, which is what we call JCO. So nursing homes have a lot of regulations with regards to how high a bed is off the floor, how, high, how wide a hallway has to be, um, what your staffing ratios are. There's, they have far more regulation than assisted living have, so. And why would somebody choose to go to a nursing home? Chances are their doctor has said, you can't go home yet. Your home is not a safe place for you to do rehab. You're gonna go from the hospital to a rehab center. And so doctors may choose a rehab. And it may be financially driven because if someone has Medicaid and they cannot move into an assisted living with, with that Medicaid, their only option may be to go to a nursing home where their Medicaid might be accepted. So they may not actually need the services that a nursing home offers, but the financially it's, it's what drives them there. And who pays for nursing home care? Again, Medicare is insurance. It's like health insurance. So typically 100 days per year in a nursing home are covered by Medicare and there must be a preceding three night hospital stay. So Medicare is not gonna pay for you to go from your home to a nursing home. They're gonna, they're gonna want you in the hospital for three days first. Bundled services kind of affects your service reimbursement. That, a bundled service means anymore Medicare says, okay, you broke your hip, that to us is worth $100,000. So from going to the hospital, your ambulance, having surgery, having all those doctor's bills in the hospital, and then you go to rehab and you have all the, you know, all the rehab, the occupational, the, the speech, the, whatever kind of therapies you have, um, 
and, and living in that nursing home, it, it, the, the, there's a pot of money for that. And that's called a bundled service. So everything that you might need for that hip fracture has been bundled into this pot of money and that's all there is. So you can't stay any longer at the rehab if the money's running out. They're gonna, they're gonna make you go home at some point because they're gonna say your Medicare ends at 100 days, you're gonna have to go home. There's also managed care, which is a Medicare replacement. Medicare replacements are called advantage plans and they offer most of the same coverages as Medicare, but what I find is not as much coverage as a Medicare plan. So sometimes you have to be careful to see what, if you do choose an Advantage plan, um, what it does cover. Medicaid is long-term financial assistance. So Medicaid has qualification requirements. Your assets and income have a five-year look back. And there's a limited amount of income you can have in order to qualify for Medicaid. But Medicaid covers housing and care. Your long-term care insurance policy would work in a nursing home. And again, veterans aid and attendance will work for nursing home care. If none of those options apply, or if your benefits have expired, or if you, um, you need to make a difference up. Maybe the your long-term care insurance only covers part of your stay at the nursing home. You would have to supplement the balance. So I don't see a lot of people having to pay out of pocket for nursing home care, but there's always the possibility of that, particularly if they if their bundled service is all used up. If all those dollars in that pot of money for that hip fracture get used up. Um, you might have to start paying out of pocket if you still need to remain in the nursing home or the rehab center. So if you need to locate senior living options in your area, the big thing is do it the privacy of your own home. You can Google it. You need to know the terminology though, because it, you, if you're looking for assisted living, don't type in nursing homes. Your search criteria is you need to be pretty specific. Maybe you want Brevard County. Maybe you want the um, assisted living in Vieira. You know, if, you, if you're specific when you do your searches, you'll have better responses to, your, to what you Google or search for. Isn't that funny? We say Google. It used to just be go look it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, your primary care physician may have some recommendations for you. Um, I always warn people, your, your physician is not necessarily educated on all the different options out there for senior living. And a lot of physicians are actually medical directors at the local nursing home. So, of course, their choice will be you need a nursing home, when chances are you could very easily just need assisted living and not a nursing home. So I know many people put a lot of faith and trust in their personal physicians. But we always need to know that, you know, they're doctors, they were trained in medicine, they weren't necessarily trained in senior living options. And then there are a lot of referral agencies out there. Many people recognize a place for mom. Um, they have a lot of commercials. And then there's caring.com. Uh, there's a lot of small local referral agencies too. And these agencies typically uh, send your information out to multiple locations. Let's say you go on to the website for a place for mom and you give them your information. You tell them you're looking for assisted living and it has to be under $3,500 a month. They don't just send you to one place. They send your information out to multiple places in that area. And so your information is being shared and you will get a overwhelming response by from all of the marketing people at these communities because they're all vying for your business. So you need to, you know, kind of be careful if you're going to use one of those referral agencies. You don't pay a referral agency though. They get their money from the community. So if you do use caring.com or a place for mom or a smaller local referral agency, there's no expense to you. 
the community that you choose, if you decide to move into a community, that community already has a contract to pay that referral agency a certain amount of money after you move in. So it's, it's attractive because it's a free service for you, but you also end up with 10 or 12 marketing people trying to get a hold of you at eight o'clock at night sometimes because they got your information that day. So I always, I always try to tell people to kind of be careful of those two.